Today I'm going to do a quick review of the B.E. Myers Mall combination visible and infrared laser and infrared illuminator device. This device is really something special. It's very, very well designed, very well made device. It is, of course, relatively expensive compared to many competing devices from other manufacturers such as Steiner or Surefire or Holosun or what have you. However, there's a fairly compelling case that this device is worth the additional cost for reasons which I will enumerate over this video. So first, just to sort of go over the device as a whole, mostly aluminum construction, uh, a little bit of protective plastic up here at the front, but generally aluminum, extremely well machined. Uh, you can just feel the, you know, the smooth surfaces. There are no machining marks. Everything fits together very, very tightly. No slop, uh, except in, in some of these switches, but uh, that is, in this case, advantageous because you don't want, you know, if a switch has too little clearance, it can get stuck. So these moving parts are, uh, they're very crisp, uh, but everything else just, you know, fits together perfectly. So I'm going to go over this device from front to back. I think that's as good in order as any. So let's go ahead and start up here. At the front, we have this combination protective device which covers the lasers and the illuminators to protect them from soot, dust, whatever else might be coming in from you know the, the muzzle of the gun or just from the air. And as we rotate this protective cover, it puts the device either into off power saving mode, visible mode, or infrared mode. So this protective cover is also a control which is sort of the, the broadest mode selector. So I'm going to go ahead, I'm actually going to take this cover off. We can put it to the infrared mode and then just push a little thing in there and then this pops right off for cleaning or maintenance or whatever. So we've got a number of things happening here. First, actually, let me talk about this. You'll notice that on the protective cover are these two metal dots, and I'll talk more about that in a little bit. That's something important about them all. But we've got a total of two lasers and three illuminators. So we've got a short range infrared illuminator, which I expect is the white square, a medium range infrared illuminator, which I expect is probably that guy right there. And then we've got a long range infrared illuminator, an infrared laser, and an invisible laser. So go ahead and pop this back on. And then you'll notice we've got this, this big visible arrow right here telling us uh, which mode we're currently on. Okay. Moving a little further back, we've got this protective plastic cover, which just makes sure that if you bump the laser on something, it's not going to uh, absorb too much of that impact through the aluminum, where it might you know, jar the internal components. And then we've got our laser zeroing mechanisms. So the infrared and visible laser are slaves together, so you can just zero the visible laser during the daytime, and the infrared laser will be zeroed as well. That's quite nice. We've got this selector here which chooses between short range, medium range, and pushing down on this little safety thing, long range mode. The short range mode uh, covers just the laser as well as the laser plus the short range illuminator. The short range illuminator is great for indoor use. It has a super, super wide angle, so it can cover the entire field of view if you're using night vision goggles and give you really, really good broad illumination. Medium mode, uh, actually, it's really just medium power, and then depending on which of the two fire buttons you use, it's either going to use, I believe, a 10 degree or a 2 degree illuminator, and this is basically just high power mode. And for the visible laser, it's low power, one to is one milliwatt, and then medium power, and then uh, 
still medium power, I guess. It's just five milliwatts in any case, although there is a uh, blinky mode. Maybe you'll find that useful. Okay, so you'll notice this little screw right here. And I was reading the manual, and it said that if you have a photonist tube, you can actually move this screw to the front socket. And I was trying to figure out how this device would know which socket the screw is in. And I was looking for an electrical contact or something, and I couldn't find anything. But then I looked at the screw, and I realized that they've actually put a little magnet inside the tip of the screw. Uh, this is this tells you a lot about the device. So A, this is it, kind of if overkill. That's pretty expensive. I, I bet that adds a few dollars to the bill of materials. Uh, but this is really, really great. So what this tells you is that the way a lot of these controls on this device work is they use Hall effect sensors. So a Hall effect sensor is a magnetic sensor. And these are great because they actually live fully with inside the casing of the device. So there doesn't have to be any hole through the device for the Hall effect sensor to work, which means one fewer place for water or other liquids to get inside the device and one fewer mechanical component that can fail. So those two metal things we saw on this front knob, those were actually two magnets. So this is based on Hall effect sensors. This, I think, is also based on Hall effect sensors, although I haven't taken it, taken it apart because it's not user serviceable. That This switch is not. Uh, but I assume it's also based on Hall effect sensors. So that's awesome. If you do scuba diving, a lot of scuba equipment uses Hall effect sensors because again, it just that's one less place for foreign materials to get inside the device, one less set of O-rings that you need that might crack and fail. And they are very, very reliable. They have an effectively infinite lifetime. So that's great. Uh, that's I would say that that's kind of overkill, uh, but that's exactly what I'm looking for in a premium safety critical device like this. Moving back a teeny bit further, if you look here and here, there are two LEDs. So when you put the mall on a mode where it can activate, whether visible or infrared, that LED will turn on. Let's see if you might not be able to see it on the camera. It's pretty dim because keep in mind that it's um, intended for uh, night vision goggle use, uh, but it'll go amber when it's ready to fire and then green when you actually fire it. Now, a lot of people have complained about these things having parasitic drain and the battery dying when they put it away. I think what's actually happening is they're accidentally leaving it in uh, fire mode and these two LEDs are on and it's just those LEDs draining the battery, which there's not really any way around that. Uh, I have put this thing in storage for months and the battery did not die and then one time I accidentally left it on one of the two on modes and uh, the battery got low because those two LEDs were on. But uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's a nice little feature. You can, you can tell what state the device is in just by looking at it. Moving further back, we have these two fire buttons. This fire button selects sort of a, a closer range mode, roughly speaking, and this one selects sort of a farther range mode. So this might be you know wider beam, medium width, and narrow width beam, or whatever. Uh, it's very intuitive interface, right? You have, if it's closer to you, it's in closer mode. If you push the button closer to you, that's a closer mode. So not a lot to uh, figure out there. It's, it's quite well designed and laid out. And then uh, towards the back, we have the battery cap. This fits a single CR123. Nothing too special there. Really well made, really well put together. And then you've got two standard switch ports so you can use the same type of switch that you use with a Steiner or any other laser. So you can connect this up to a tape switch. One of these corresponds to button A and one of these corresponds to button B. So you can pick which behavior you want on your tape switch. If you wanted, you could even have two tape switches. I personally just have one and uh, I connect it to whichever mode causes the green laser to blink on high power. I, I did some comparison. I decided that one made a little more sense. Okay. And uh, moving on to the mount, this mount is really, really solid and nice. It, uh, it feels very sturdy. It's just, you know, you can tighten it by hand and then you can come in with a quarter or something and tighten it the rest of the way. In the manual, they caution you that if you over tighten it, you might damage your rail, which I always view as a good sign when uh, the, the warning is not that you might break this device, but you might break something else. That's uh, generally the manufacturer 
has a pretty good confidence in their device if they put something like that in the manual. But uh, yeah, nice, nice wide rail. You've got two lugs. You've got a good grip from this thing. So that's great. Let's talk a little bit about the actual laser technology in this device and one of the things that makes the mall unique compared to its current competitors. So if you want to build an infrared illuminator, infrared laser, and sell it in the US, you have to satisfy the rules of the FDA. So the US FDA, which is the Food and Drug Administration, they claim jurisdiction over all devices which admit, radi emit radiation. This uh, seems fairly unreasonable to me. That's, that's kind of a crazy domain to claim jurisdiction over. If you know anything about physics, you know everything emits radiation. But uh, nonetheless, that is the way the law currently works. So the FDA sets various power limits on laser devices. So if you have an LED infrared illuminator, that can be as powerful as you want. If you buy an infrared illuminator from Surefire or HDS Systems or whoever, that might be several hundred milliwatts. So very bright, but those LED illuminators can't be focused to a super tight beam. So for really long range applications, <coughs> excuse me, they do not perform as well. And uh, they also have issues with, you know, uh, overspill. And if you have a suppressor, then the illumination is going to hit the suppressor and so on. So you can have a laser based illuminator, but then you're subject to FDA laser power limits, which are generally something like 0 0.7 milliwatts for infrared laser devices where the laser beam uh, leaves the device. So 0 0.7 milliwatts, in my opinion, that is sufficient in most cases for the actual laser aiming device, as long as you're using Gen 3 night vision devices. 0 0.7 milliwatts is, is perfectly sufficient to see a laser dot to quite a long distance unless you are under very adverse lighting conditions. But for an illuminator, it's not very much. And uh, I don't think, I think most civilian illuminators are closer to something like three milliwatts on the IR side. So I don't know exactly how that works. But anyway, they're quite weak. So if you look at the power label here, you'll notice that it says that the uh, infrared power output can be up to 150 milliwatts. And if you look in the manual for the civilian version, the illuminator, depending on what mode you have it set to, the maximum power output is something like 80 or 90 milliwatts. So this is obviously much higher than what you can normally buy. So what's going on here? Well, BE Myers is using a relatively new technology called a Vixel laser, which stands for Vertical Cavity Surface Emitting Laser. So it's a relatively new way of constructing semiconductor lasers and what it lets them do is put a bunch of lasers really close together on the same little chip. So I guess from a legal standpoint, what's going on is they, instead of having one really powerful laser, they actually have a bunch of small, weak lasers that they sort of focus through one lens. So the effect is almost as if you have a single powerful laser. Now, this feels like a bit of a... Uh, a little bit of a loophole maybe, but uh, I mean, the law itself doesn't make a ton of sense. So, you know, I I'm not criticizing, uh, good for them. But the end result is that you can get a really nice high quality beam that's very powerful and it's in a civilian device. So good work, B.E. Myers. That's a good design in my book. So overall, super, super well constructed device. Uh, really, really good design. I mean, uh, one thing I should also mention is um, this is the right-handed configuration. So this clamps on top of the gun, and then you use your thumb to control it, and then this hangs over the right side. But if you look down here, this whole thing is mirror symmetric along this angle. So you can actually take the battery compartment off, flip it around, and put it back on, and now you'll have a left side laser. So you can put it on whichever side of the gun you want. Just worth mentioning. But yeah, really, really good design, very clean, solid design, very robust. Uh, I expect that this thing is going to last me for a long time. So in terms of price, this device is obviously more expensive than competing devices from Steiner or Surefire or HollowSun or whoever. But if you 
compare what you're actually getting, I think this device comes out pretty favorably. So for starters, the build quality is exceptional, uh, noticeably higher than Steiner. I mean, you know, Steiner's fine, but uh, the fit and finish is not as good on a Steiner. A lot of people have had QC issues. You know, I've had issues with my buttons. A lot of people have had issues with the tape switch ports and so on. So my expectations for the reliability of this device are a lot higher, both based on, you know, just observing the device and using it and also reports from other users in terms of uh, what issues they've run into, if any. And uh, you have much better illuminators in this device. So you have three illuminators instead of one that you can rapidly switch between and also generally much higher power output than in competing civilian devices by, uh, you know, at least an order of magnitude. So expensive, yes, but uh, I think it's pretty reasonable compared to what you're getting. And uh, if you're budget constrained, this is not the way to go, obviously. But uh, if you want the best of the best and you're willing to uh, pay for something that goes the extra mile in terms of quality and reliability and functionality, then this is probably the thing to consider. One more little detail, uh, just because I'm looking at it. Uh, it's got a little hole for a lanyard, so if you want to do retention onto your gun, in case you're worried this is going to fall off or something, uh, that's an option too. But uh, yeah, overall, I'm super satisfied with this device. This is what I use on my primary gun, which I do all my night vision stuff with for the most part. So uh, any questions, feel free to you know, leave something in the comments and uh, I will get back to you. Hopefully this overview is helpful if you're trying to figure out, you know, what are the advantages and disadvantages of this thing. I'd say really the only disadvantage is the price and uh, beyond that, it's just chock full of advantages. So uh, yeah, let me know if you have any questions.